doing today sweet day three day three of twitchcon how many folks in the audience right now are streamers have your own channels are streaming to twitch on the fairly regular awesome got about a little bit over a, maybe a half how many people of those do you think that what you have at home you call your home studio okay about half of those so like that's what we're gonna talk about is what kind of like the difference between a home studio and gonna, or in a, in a streaming rig. And we're gonna t help you turn it into a little bit more of a studio. Now, how many of you have about $50,000 to invest in your studio? No, okay, cool, right. You're at the right panel because what we're gonna talk about is stuff that you can afford to do that will greatly improve the way that, you know, your, your product is created to go to Twitch. Um, if you do, when you do get budgets, you know, um, there's a lot of really great products that make things super easy and tighten things way up and take your stuff to the next level. You got new tech over here. You've got a lot of other products that you could check out um, around here. But we're going to get into some kind of DIY stuff. So first, uh, tell you a little bit about who I am and why I am telling you all of this stuff. Um, my name is Tracy Peterson. I'm the uh, founder and managing producer of the AV Society. Uh, it's my company. We are actually running four uh, panel stages upstairs and the Indie and EDU stage here at TwitchCon. We've done a lot of work with them. I used to uh, run video production for uh, IPL, and I've worked wi with uh, the fine folks at GameSpot um, and a bunch of others, and I've done a lot of video game streams. And basically, I focus on live streaming um, as a product. And like you, I started out with you know a computer and you know OBS or XSplit or something. Um, I think back in the day when I used XSplit, it was just like a little plug-in that you would use to make it connect to FFmpeg. So everything was very much DIY at that stage. So, um, and if you want to game with me ever, there's, those are my uh, gamer tags. You can go ahead and send me an invite. We'll play. Um, well, that was that. Here's just a little demonstration of how long I've been around, because that's one of my favorite games ever. I can always get to like the little credit stage. All right. Studios don't need to be expensive to have a high quality product. And your home studio doesn't, e doesn't even, I mean, when you're looking at budgets, we're talking about the <laughs> budget that you might in one year, right? That you might get from, you know, selling one camera or something like that. These are things that are going to improve your quality very easily that you can do, you know, in an afternoon of a trip to Home Depot or something. Uh, so this is the TriCaster broadcast panel that is backstage over at Kappa Theater. Um, this is what it looks like when you get to that point where, where you're uh, on the big time stage. This is not what we're going to be working with today. My uh, panel is right over there, actually. Blake, would you throw me that little panel next to you, the right? To your right. There you go. Hold on. I forgot to bring it up here. So this is actually mine, right? So you can see a, a vast difference. And it's not about how many buttons you have or how, what it's just what it does and how it allows you to get around your studio and perform and do your stuff more smoothly and get your product out without errors. Finding little things make all the difference. It's all about small changes. Like I said, it's not about like a lot of these changes that we're going to go over are things that you make like one adjustment and you're going to see a massive change in what it is that you're creating and what your video stream looks like. Um, and it's actually kind of funny because we I just saw upstairs these guys were talking about your audience sometimes won't even let you change stuff. So if something's kind of, if something's kind of uh, low budge, sometimes your audience will like it that way and never let you change. But what are you going to do? So, um, so here's kind of an order of priority and this list is learned from, uh, you know, years of production work. If you talk to any of the professionals on the floor, if you verify this list, this is like the gold standard list in order of appearance this is how you should fix any questions of quality about your stream. So the first thing is audio. Audio is 
by far the most important thing that you can fix uh, on your streaming quality. And it doesn't really matter, like, you know, you, the difference between like high quality audio and low quality audio and like no quality audio, as soon as you get any quality in there, it's amazing improvement. So by far, this is where your first budget purchase should be. Um, lighting is almost as critical, but it's a second step down. It's like, you know, that next notch down. And as you learn how to do lighting, and it is an art form, it's you're painting as much with the light as you would with a paintbrush. You're, you're, you're looking at how the light accentuates shape and develops the, the depth of your shot. So, you know, you'll learn those things over time, but it's a matter of practicing and actually having the right tools that allow you to play and make a difference when you're in your streaming time. Camera quality isn't as, uh, as hugely important as people make it out. Like, there's a lot of people who are camera geeks, and that's cool because, you know, everybody has their own kind of, you know, niche of uh, passion for whatever it is that they're into. But, like, cameras don't necessarily make or break a stream. It's going to be audio and lighting first. Um, in fact, there was a, a, a shootout of DSLR quality back in the day, uh, you know, not the back of the day, but like in 2011 or 2012, and Martin Scorsese was a, a part of the DSLR shootout, and they, he shot on a G, uh, GH4, I think, a Panasonic, um, and of the other ones, like, you know, like the Canons and, um, and Nikon uh, DSLRs that were shooting on, he boiled it all down to lighting. He won the shootout um, against a bunch of other cameras and even larger, like, cinema cameras, and he was doing it on a little DSLR, and the whole reason he won that shootout was because, I mean, he's Martin Scorsese, and he rolls out with, you know, a massive, awesome army of great, great, great lighting people, so, you know, the camera really didn't matter at that point. Finally, set or backdrop scenes of interest, right? You want to decorate a little bit. You know, I've seen a lot of streamers, like, they, they kind of opt for chopping out the background and throwing green screen in, and that's cool. I like, I like that. I think it's neat the way they can overlay. Um, but it can get kind of complex and unwieldy for a lot of people. Uh, for a lot of people, for myself, sometimes it's faster. Um, instead of setting up a green screen and worrying about lighting that green screen correctly so it keys well, um, if you just set up something nice, like a curtain behind you and maybe a little sign, you know, and light it, light yourself well, and like maybe have a dimmer light in the background and just, you know, have some depth of field, even a picture in picture with no cutout can be really cool, right? Because you're sharing your personality and what's happening behind you. So that's kind of an important step, too. So we'll get to a little bit of that. Okay, so going back to audio, one of the most important things to learn um, is about how microphone patterns pick up sound around you, because everybody's got different environments in the location that they're at. They could have noise coming in from different places in the house. They could have equipment running, you know, washer and dryer, whatever else, and stuff. That sometimes you can't really do a whole lot to get rid of those noises. So knowing how these work uh, really helps you figure out how to shape that noise and make it so that your voice what people actually are there to hear is the stuff that, that's coming through clearly. So omnidirectional microphones, and you know, and these are the words that are going to be printed right on the box. So when you go shopping for your microphone, um, look for these terms. Omnidirectional means everywhere. So you're getting um, sound from every location. Lavalier mics are often omnidirectional, um, and they're not really great, especially in environments like this where there's tons and tons of noise coming in from everywhere. You're gonna pick up everything, and that doesn't really give you the opportunity to isolate your voice and become the dominant, the dominant sound in the place, right? And that's, and this is a cardioid microphone that I'm speaking into now. That's why, like, right now, when I have my microphone directly in front of me and my mouth fairly closed, you hear my voice very clearly. But as I change the angle and move it away, even though I speak louder and louder, it doesn't do anything to it, right? So this really isolates the sound of my voice apart from all the noises that can uh, distract your audience from what you have to say. So the cardioid tends to be one of my favorite mics, especially for vocal presentation. Um, omnidirectional is great, but if you wanted all that noise in there, sometimes you'll throw like an omnidirectional at the stage and turn it down real low so that you have at least a little bit of, of ambient noise, but, but really when you want to isolate, cardioid is the way to go. Hypercardioid includes a little bit of stuff from behind, and that, that will allow a little bit of sound coming in from the other side of the microphone, but, um, it, but it doesn't, it's not, as strong as the omnidirectional is. So, so cardioid, hypercardioid, fairly similar. Bidirectional, um, it kind of simulates the two sides, but nothing on the other axis. And then shotgun is extremely linear, like a, it's got a laser focus. That's the kind of microphone that you'd see on the end of a boom in a film shoot, you know, that people are holding over their head and they have it right pointed at the people's mouths directly, directly from the top. That's that type of microphone. Um, Oftentimes, those are used for different types of musical interests as well. Um, 
personally, for the vast majority of streaming applications, a cardioid microphone is where you want to be. And you know, they make some really great like Audio Technicas or Sennheiser headsets would have the boom mic in them. Those are fairly expensive. I would argue that even if you just took whatever headset with a boom mic, there's Astro makes pretty good ones. They have, they have pretty good uh, microphones on them. Uh, we've got some other friends over here at Turtle Beach um, and others that you can kind of go and check out. But um, just that even that starter microphone is going to improve everything from a webcam microphone in a huge way. Um, All right, some people, <coughs> some people like to go straight in with like a USB microphone, plug it right in with, um, you know, and just have it from there. I, I, having had used mixers and learned how to use them, um, I can't not use a mixer. It doesn't, once I, I can't give up that power. It's, it's, it's much better to use a mixer. I like this particular small mixer. Um, this runs about 40 bucks. It's Behringer Xenix 302 USB powered. The other, the one of the reasons why I like it a lot is that it is, it is USB powered. I can just plug it into a laptop. Um, if I have a laptop that I'm traveling with and I want to stream from there, I can use that. I can plug it into the back of the PC. It doesn't require another, you know, wall wart that I have to plug in. It's got one XLR mic interface, so it means that I can plug one professional microphone into it. It's also got a really neat microphone and headset jack on the side that are made to order for a headphone set that with a microphone. And the way that you operate this, you can actually set it in line so that you have your computer sound coming through the USB in, and you have your headset going in. You're mixing them, listening to them at the same time so that you can verify exactly what your audience is going to hear, and then you can send it back out USB to your, OS, your, your OBS or XSplit or whatever you're, whatever you're using, your setup, and use that as your main mix. Now you've got all of the feeds coming in clean, no loop, no echo. Um, and it gives you a lot of power because you could change the balance and the, and the EQ as well. Um, so, but we talked a lot about audio, but lighting is still super critical. Um, okay, soft, well, so soft versus hard light is, is the question there. That's actually a, a typo, my apologies. Um, this is a hard light. This is what's considered a hard light. It, you see a, a hard edge around every shadow. It's not necessarily the most flattering light that you want to use. So right now, if you're if the way that you're lighting it is a bare bulb in your studio, you want to consider diffusing it, and that could be, you know, throwing a little bit of uh, of uh, uh, white linen material around it, like a, you know, take an old sheet, cut a square out of it, put it in front of the bulb, so that it'll just diffuse the the rays of the light and make that those those shadows much softer. This particular one is hard, so I, I don't and I don't have a demo of like what it would look like to be softer, but almost all the photography that you see, the professional photography that you see uses soft lighting. Um, it, and it's also the difference between certain uh, bulbs that you look at, if you see like the filament glowing inside the bulb and some that you see that are just nice and bright and soft. Um, always stick to the soft, soft lights. And you can also get diffused material, and it's, it basically comes in a sheet and a roll you can get on Amazon and then cut the piece out that you want and then wrap it around. Now, I recommend, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna show you a list of it, but I recommend LED bulbs. They're cooler, they use less electricity, that your room's gonna stay warmer, and then you could do that where you actually wrap it, and it won't, you don't have a risk of it lighting on fire, which is, you know, a plus, to say the least. Um, dimmers, so dimmers are kind of like the, the difference between pro and not pro light, right? Like, sticking a dimmer on the end of a light makes it like instantly way more useful in a professional environment, because you can basically, if you put several lights out, you can start to adjust them so that like you have a lower light here, a brighter light here, which adds to the effect of a 3D effect when you're looking at the, the, the camera framing. Um, we're gonna talk about it in a second. We're gonna talk about what's called a three-point lighting setup, which is kind of like, is it, who, who's heard of the three-point lighting setup before? All right, we got a few hands, that's great. So three-point lighting is kind of like the gold standard starter lighting kit setup, right? And we'll talk a little bit about that, but um, you're going to look up that on Google at some point. You're going to, that's where you're, you're going to start your journey into lighting experience. Um, color differences. You want all of the bulbs to be the same color. So if you ever go into a store and you look at a bulb and it says warm or cool, right? Those are references to the color uh, white balance of those bulbs, right? So a warm bulb is going to be more orange and a cool bulb is going to be more blue. If you don't know it already, 
the outside light, daylight coming into your room is excessively blue. It's, it's, it's way on the cool scale, right? Your bulbs in your house, which are probably tungsten, are on the warm scale, okay? So when you light your home studio, you want to make it all one uniform color, right? Unless you're, you know, and later then you can, then you play with color washes and stuff for, for a, a special effect. But when you're lighting, your general lighting setup, you want it to all be one color. So, you know, cover up your windows, get the same color bulbs, and go from there. Yeah, so these are the LED bulbs and fittings that I was talking about, and this comes down to about $35 per fitting. So you need about three of these for your home three-point lighting setup, right? So we're looking at 100-watt equivalent LED dimmable bulbs, and dimmable is a key feature of that. Um, so then you hook up the dimmer, and you put them in one of these nice little clippy things. That's nine bucks a pop for the little clip dish, right? And you can hang that on your bookshelf, or you can clip it to the back of your monitor, or you can put it on your desk. Right, and that gives you your three, your three starter lights. Um, so now coming back to the prop design, so you know you could buy props, you could pick up swag from, you know, the folks that are trying to to interest you in having their products on your stream in the first place. Um, you could put a bookshelf behind you. You could put all your trophies that you've collected from, you know, con to con, or or trophies that you've had from your game. If you're a pro gamer, obviously, show off your medals. If you're if you're into a particular game, show off the models that you've built about the game or the paintings that you made or drawings that you've made, drawings that you've received from your audience, you know, all kinds of stuff. Um, you want to consider lighting the backdrop as well. Maybe add one of those lighting fixtures and put a snoot on it by using black wrap. You're going to see all of this. By the way, at the end of this, you're going to see an Amazon uh, wish list that I've created for you, um, and it's set to public, so you can go ahead and grab that link. You're going to see all of these items listed that you can then go ahead and just grab whatever you might need. Um, so you could basically take another one of those, use the dimmer, use what's called black wrap to kind of wrap it around and create like a snoot, really control the light, and put a little spotlight on something in the background. But having the, that visual interest behind you breaks up, you know, kind of what you're doing in front of you, and it gives them, you know, it, it just it adds that kind of like unspoken quality, that subjective quality to the shot. Um, let's go back one, one thing. So one, one thing that I, that I didn't mention, though, is the hanging curtains. Um, this is also a thing that you're going to see on there. I use, like, just black cotton material, and then I'll hang a curtain rod behind, right? And it's even just, just making the wall black and creating that kind of infinite fall off behind you, it, 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 me it, it means a lot to the, to the setup. Um, the interesting thing about hanging curtains, too, is that that reduces the amount of audio bounce in the room that you're working from, right? So even if all you did was like hang some curtains behind you and then hang some in front of you, right? You're immediately canceling out the audio waves coming from your mouth and the ones that are kind of going up the ceiling. And you, you, when it comes to audio, you can't, you're not really like, you're not really stopping the audio. You're just causing it to bounce in ways that is no longer detrimental to your audio pickup, right? So by having curtains hanging on one wall and hanging curtains behind you, you're making it bounce in such a way as that your room itself is going to sound very dead and very soft, and you're going to reduce a lot of things like little buzzes and hums and background hums that you don't like. So again, as a matter of set design and audio improvement, hang curtains. Um, and this is a little bit more advanced. We were we were talking about this on the side of the stage about like where this kind of goes as far as building your home studio, but also consider video I/O, right? Like a lot of us use PCs, a lot of us use webcams. And we just talked about adding a microphone being a huge, huge improvement, yes. But if you want to do other things, like you want to add a second camera, you want to add like a professional camera, you want to add, uh, you know, have like more than one console, have another PC off to the side running another video stream coming in, um, you need to look into video I.O. And when you look at video I.O., we're talking about capture devices, and those come from companies like um, Blackmagic Design, Magewell, and others. Um, you can. You have basically two options there as far as video connection. There's uh, SDI, which is Serial Digital Interface, which is the professional connectors. And then you have the HDMI connectors as well. Um, and depending on the devices that you have that make video signal, whether it's a console, which would be HDMI, or a camera, which might be SDI, that's how you'll make your choices there. Um, some entry-level brands for those. Blackmagic Design, they make an amazing HDMI capture card for PCIe. 
that is um, about 200 bucks, right? It's a great starter card, and it actually does 4K as well. So it'll be ready for when you, the Scorpio comes out and all that stuff. Um, Elgato makes uh, really great USB capture cards. Um, Magewell makes both. Um, and then we kind of get into the other brands of like, uh, and you may already have, I know a lot of folks who use USB products have Blue or Turtle Beach items as well. Um, when it comes to software, um, OBS, XSplit are the kind of the open source, um, semi-open source stuff. And Game Show, one of our new ones, I added, I added them because, well, they're right over there. And you can talk to them and learn a little bit more. And they're actually the entry level version of um, Telestream's products, which are, are they're a really great, re really re well respected brand in the pro side as well. So the benefit of trying them out is actually that you kind of start on that pro path already once you get a little bit of experience with them. Um, so places to shop for stuff that's really super cheap, right? Home Depot is one of my favorite places to get stuff for my home uh, theater. Because, um, you know, you can go back down to that, you get scrap wood there even, but you get curtain hangers, cheap light fittings, 100 watt dimmable LED bulbs, dimmers, um, and one more trick, again, without getting into like construction, if you need a place to hang your lights, just make a square out of PVC pipe and put it up on the ceiling, and then you have something to clamp to. Um, that doesn't damage too much, but you know, all those things are there, they're super cheap, you know, you can get away with a, a lighting truss that you can hang from your ceiling for like 25 bucks. Fabric stores, um, again, curtain materials, so if you wanna hang drapes behind you. Um, fabric stores are great places to start. You can get like 20, 30 bucks, you can walk out with a whole wall full of wall covering. You can also cu cover your table, and again, even by like, you know, throwing a, a, a cloth over the top of a table and letting it drape on the sides, it creates another barrier for audio to start bouncing against. And that's where you're gonna start deadening the sound once again. Um, can't, I can't stress that enough. Again, audio is so important. Um, Amazon, basically everything you can get from Amazon, but I, I keep like worrying, like I'm not trying to like point, the, put it home too hard being that it's Amazon's uh, Amazon show, but you know, you can get a lot of stuff there and I order a lot of stuff there on Prime because it's so useful, but you know, basic microphones are, there's a ton of really great microphones that are there. We were even talking, like you can find articles online that some of these like $50 microphones, if, if you're a DIY sort, like you can look up the articles about it, just pop it open, you know, solder one thing here or there, and all of a sudden you've got an equivalent of like a $500 microphone um, with just a little bit of labor, right? So if you're into it and you're willing to learn, and that's what this is all about. If you're willing to learn a little bit, if you're willing to research a little bit, all of these topics can be can lead you down a path to incredibly uh, a, a ton of improvement without a very big outlay and expense. Um, so, could you forward that? Guys, could you could you go ahead and advance it? What? No, I had one more. All right. Well, there was. There's not a slide. There's not a slide that shows the the Amazon wish list on it. I'm hoping, I'm hoping. Anyway, um, I had set up an Amazon wish list. I will go, uh, it's because your screen's frozen up here. I don't see, I don't see what you see. My apologies, we may have, this is also the risk of doing things on the cheap, come on. Oh, there we are. Ah, this is what I wanted, this is what I wanted. My apologies, thank you. Thank you very much for getting that up. Um, so first, Google the term three-point lighting. That's where you're gonna learn how to lay that out, all right? Um, then you want to Google microphone polar patterns. That'll help you understand how the microphones actually do their job. 
Google white balance and lighting color balance, right? And this will talk about the color of light and how, how the color of light affects your shot. One of my favorite topics that is the by far the nerdiest topic on the list is video resolutions explained, okay? If you, if you, write, if you Google that, you're gonna get to learn a lot about what is the difference between 720p, 1080p, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's super useful to know that if you're a streamer because you know, that's gonna get into bit rates, it's gonna get into you know, the quality level that you're streaming. Do you, why would you want to stream 720 or 1080 and so on? There are some amazing tutorial educational sites out there one being Film Riot, the other being Indie Mogul. All of these have very entertaining videos, series, that will help you understand a little bit more about um, how to improve the stuff that you're doing. Now something that one of, our, uh, one of our crew members provided just a little earlier is DIY sound diffusion. Audio being such an important piece and audio being such a huge uh, question that a lot of people ask. Um, you can actually go and build your own panels that are you know, the quality level that you would find in a, very hi in a, in a high end recording studio. Um, you can learn how to build them on your own for, again, uh, the, the price of parts that you would buy at Home Depot. Uh, and finally, at the bottom there is the wish list that I made that includes all those parts. It looked like to me that if I were to buy everything on that list that I would want, like if I was walking into a bare room in a new apartment and I was setting up a PC streaming setup that had like a webcam, microphone, or whatever else, I would, um, I would buy all these things. I have the, the quantity set up there as well, but it looked like you would probably get away with about 300, 350. If you pushed it, maybe like 400 bucks would get you everything on the list. It would set you up uh, as a great start with a high quality image, uh, well lit, a great audio sound profile and everything. So with that, um, I think that's pretty much everything that I have to say. I, I, I may have no more time or do I have time? I have five more minutes on my scheduled time and because um, I'm the producer of this stage. We're gonna stay another five minutes or so to answer any questions that you may have. So Jody's got a microphone right here. If you have a question that you want answered, please come to Jody right there, that gentleman. And if you'd like to, if you'd like to have any questions answered, go ahead and line up right here in this in this aisle. Are you gonna explain the thing on the table? Say it one more time. What is that? What is this? Oh. That's a great question. So this um, is an X-Keys pad. Uh, this X-Keys pad is made by PI Engineering. You can get it on Amazon. I bought this on Amazon. Um, I use these extensively, like that, that picture that I showed you before of the, the full broadcast panel, and you can, you can see one as well over here at the New Tech booth. Um, the professional broadcast panel gives you basically everything that you need to do um, in a video show at, at, your, at your fingertips so that you can switch scenes, you can fade between items, you can load picture in picture, you can you know, switch sources, whatever you want. Um, you know, mute an audio source, turn on an audio source, that kind of stuff. So, so essentially at the beginning of your, of your production, once you decide what it is that you want your show to look like, you basically can program something like this to all the key presses that would result in those changes, right? So you could, you could basically have it like set to go to the next scene, change scenes, run a commercial, you know, all kinds of stuff. So these are really handy because you can kind of keep them off to the side and they, don't, and they don't take up the same keys as your keyboard, right? Because you, they're, they're additional USB inter interface. So um, I like them. These are, these are starting to get into the less cheap mode, though. Um, this particular one's about $130. Yeah, you're welcome. So I currently use uh, some high-end USB mic setups. And I was wondering, and I mix digitally on a standalone PC. Is there a noticeable difference between like an XLR setup and the mixing boards that are physical compared to digital mixing with, the, say, a USB mic? Um, some people argue that, yes, there is a, a, a difference between an analog signal and a digital signal in its tone. You'll, you'll hear a lot of times about tone, like a, a warmer tone with analog and a, and a more a colder tone with digital. Um, I'm not really an audio audiophile, so I can't hear it myself. And personally, my opinion on that is that the 90% of people don't really notice it as much as well. Um, when you start getting into things like you know the bass content or the treble content of a particular sound, those are very noticeable. Um, and I don't think that there's any real difference between analog and digital as far as how they sound. Um, to me, it's more how you do it in one source, right? If you have a lot of USB sources and you're managing them you know, through a digital mixer or a software mixing interface and you have the same level of control, I mean, that's kind of the same, that's kind of the same deal as I would consider like a lot of XLR sources going into one large mixing panel. Um, 
for me, it's really about having control, right? If you, if you are able to get it to do what you want and, and you know, make sure that you're not, you know, you're able to get it clean, there's no buzz and everything else. Um, and then there's the other option of like, if, if you're gonna be working with other people, right? If you, USB tends to not be like the professional option, right? So, so on the other side of things is like, if you are going to work with, into other people's productions or if you're gonna work w like in the field or you know, go to events like this and, and you might need to borrow something here and there, XLR seems to be a better choice for that. So, anyway. Hi there. Um, Mike, I was just wondering if you could touch on um, using soft boxes versus the lighting equipment that you suggested. I don't know if it was like a space kind of a thing because I know soft boxes tend to be, you know, you can buy them, you know, huge or like kind of small, but I was just curious as to why you didn't really touch on using a soft box versus the, you know, again, the lighting setup. Sure. I, so so I, I, I really did just gloss over that. You're right. So so um, we're talk we did talk about soft versus hard light and when you talk about soft boxes, literally soft boxes are made to, um, to shape light coming out of a, a particular uh, a light. Sometimes you can even build a box around the subject so that all the lights on the outside are hit, are diffused on the way in. Um, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, on the cheap side of things, in order to build soft boxes, um, I was briefly saying that you could like cut up a sheet or something and hang it in front of the light and it would diffuse it. Um, but there's also some other really cool uh, cheap ways to build soft boxes as well. Like you could buy um, what they call our China balls, which are the big white paper ball lantern, you could buy those and you could get them in different sizes and like buy the five pack, right? Um, and they cost like eight bucks for like 10 of them or something. And so you buy like a foot and a half, one of those, put it around an LED light on a dimmer and now you have this really big soft glowing thing. It does take away some of the brightness, but it makes what it remains super soft. So it, it you know, you have no more hard edges at that point. Another option is you can get like a white silk, um, collapsible like laundry bin, right? And they sell them online where there's, you know, the kind that you can kind of crunch down and put in the closet. Well, those, those uh, translucent white ones, again, they block a little bit of the light, but you know, they, 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 they kind of make it bounce around in a very appealing way inside of it. And they, be, they turn the, the little small point light into a big uh, kind of fluffy soft light and that spreads it across your room. So those are two cheap ways to get a soft box effect without a particularly like specifically built soft box. So, anybody else, any final questions? Well, thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. I hope that, you know, all your streaming, and, and it doesn't really matter where you start. It, all that matters, the most important thing is to hit that button and start streaming, and the rest will come. So, thank you very much. <laughs>